from the center of the earth. This is Dictor Van Doomcock, the future ruler of Earth. And I am here today to present you with Super Chat Square Ups, Volume 2. Yes, my friends, at the end of my 17,000 subscribers celebratory live stream, uh, when we had gone six hours, uh, everybody was getting fatigued. And so I went ahead and stopped the proceedings and promised that I would go ahead and answer all remaining Super Chats in a Square Up Reel. And this is going to be the procedure from now on because uh, I do not want to slight anyone. And when I start getting loopy after, you know, five or six hours, I think it's much better to go ahead and uh, put a break on the proceedings. However, we leave no Super Chat behind. When you guys are kind enough to support me in that way with a Super Chat, rest assured I will always always answer, even if the answer is delayed in a square up volume. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move to these chats. And the first one comes from my friend Turbo Donk. Hail Turbo Donk with a $5 and two cent super chat. And Turbo Donk says, you see me now a veteran of a thousand psychic wars. Hmm. To which I will reply, don't fear the reaper, baby. Take my hand. Don't. Fear the Reaper. We'll be able to fly. Don't fear the Reaper. Baby, I'm your man. <laughs> so, Turbo Dong, you're a fan of Blue Oyster Cult as well. You, sir, have excellent taste, but that's no surprise to me since you are listening to Overlord DVD on this live stream. Well, now, this super chat, square up. I absolutely adore Blue Oyster Cult, and I am... Uh, gratified to see that lyric. I also like, of course, Go Go Godzilla, but that's no surprise. I think uh, Blue Oyster Cult is a very geek-friendly band, you know? I think that they are, their themes of horror and science fiction uh, resonate with those of our kind, and I'm, uh, I'm just a big fan of theirs. At this point, I'd also like to reference the infamous Saturday Night Live sketch where they are recording Don't Fear the Reaper, and you've got Christopher Walken saying, I gotta have more cowbell, baby. <laughs> it's just a fucking classic, isn't it? Man, and Will Farrell with his gut sticking out, banging on that cowbell is classic. And of course, Jimmy Fallon is over there, uh, and he, he's cracking up. He's having to turn away from the camera all the time because it's just cracking him up so much. And uh, it's very interesting. Because uh, it's my understanding that this sketch was almost cut, and they actually stuck it on pretty much towards the end of the episode, if not the final sketch of the episode that it was on, and uh, it just like it just killed. It just became a, a a timeless cult, as popular as Don't Fear the Reaper itself. Gotta have more cowbell, baby. I wish I could do Christopher Walken. I've just never been able to master that particular art. Uh, thank you, Turbo Donk, so much for that. Uh, Basil, mm, Basil, with a $5 Canadian super chat, my legionnaire Basil. Uh, thank you, Basil. And he says, you people that think Otto Man and the powers of Matthew Starr sucked, hang your heads in shame. They were awesome series, and you call yourselves geeks? Well... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to, uh, I wouldn't argue with such a wise man, Basil. Uh, that said, you know, there were certain series that uh, Doomcock just couldn't bring himself to watch. You know, I mean, the power of Matthew Starr, with, you know, wasn't it spelled with two R's or something like that? Or was it just one R? Anyway, you know, the fact that he's like, you know, a, a a, a, a psychic or a spaceman or whatever the fuck Matthew Starr was. And his last name is Starr. I mean, that's okay with, you know, David Bowie, right? With, you know, uh, Ziggy Stardust, because, you know, it's David Bowie. I mean, what, look at him in that glam makeup and stuff. What the fuck else are you going to call him but Ziggy Stardust, you know? <laughs> I mean, but, you know, Matt, it's like, it's like uh, I don't know. Like like a like a fifties you know kitty sci fi show called you know uh, the Adventures of Jimmy Space Whoosh. yes Jimmy Space in Cadet Space School he confronts strange aliens on planets 
in comets and on his faithful spaceship Rocket XL4, he goes out into space, does Jimmy Space or Johnny Space. What did I call him? Who cares? Listen, that's why I didn't watch <laughs> the powers of Matthew Starr, but you're right. I mean, it may have been brilliant. I just don't know. I'm speaking from a place of ignorance. You know, I've seen the ads. I've seen the promotions for it. Uh, yeah. And Auto Man, I've never heard of Auto Man. You know, I, I've heard of, of auto repair shops and I've heard local commercials that probably had like a superhero saying, Auto Man! But yeah, I don't, I don't even know what Auto Man is, dude. So, uh, you know, the, the world of geeks, Geekery, geekitude, planet geek can accommodate a wide, wide, wide variety of people. So, you know, leave, leave us not pass judgment on each other. Uh, and, and nobody can know everything. And uh, I think I've got a pretty good cr geek cred, Basil. You know, uh, I'd say Arc 2 is one of my favorite uh, sh science fiction shows, you know. I, uh, I, and and that's, that's pretty obscure. You know, so we, we, we all, uh, we all just got to get along. We all just got to get along, Basil. But your point is well taken. Uh, you know, mocking one series is going to offend somebody in the world. And I guess today that somebody was you, Basil. But thank you, sir, for the super chat and for defending the powers of Matthew Starr. Oh, you did spell it with two R's. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the powers of Matthew Starr, good God. Well, uh, I, I will head, hang my head in shame, Basil. I'm sorry. I really am. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll check out an episode, but then if it sucks, I'm coming for you, Basil. I'm coming for you. Just to let you know. All right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, we've got a $5 super chat from our good friends, Classic Comics. Hail a classic comics, and he says, Hey, don't drink that water, Ren. Beavers do their business in that water. You'll get beaver fever. <laughs> oh, the greatness that was Ren and Stimpy. Good God in heaven, the greatness that was Ren and Stimpy is almost indescribable, frankly. It was so damn good. It was so miraculous. John Chris Falusi, you worked miracles, my friend. I'm sorry that lightning never really struck twice for you like it did on that show, and you were ejected far too soon. It's a crime against geek manity. Damn it. God, I wish I was in an alternate reality where Ren and Stimpy had gotten a season two and a season three with John Kay. Oh, the mayhem that would have ensued, as opposed to the tepid imitation that followed in our dimension. Thank you, Classic Comics, for that comment and for being a fan of the one true Ren and Stimpy. Which brings us to Chappie. Hail Chappie. Thank you, sir, for this $5 super chat. And Chappie says, Birds of Prey 2002 is still better than STD. Well, good God. Of course it is. I can't disagree with that at all. But, I mean, my God, look at who was in it. You know, Ashley Scott as the Huntress? Mm-mm-mm. Mia Sarah. Oh, man, Mia Sarah. Watching her in Legend still makes my heart stop. Boy, oh, boy, Mia Sarah. Mm. Rachel Scarston was the Black Canary. Dina Meyer was Barbara Gordon. Holy crap. Uh, these casting choices alone more than compensate for any narrative difficulties in that film. And so, uh, yes, your thesis is now hereby scientifically and objectively proven by Doomcock. Right here, right now, Birds of Prey 2002, vastly, vastly better than Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> it's hard to quantify things like writing and cinematography and so on, but you just know that, you know, you just know that Bird of Prey is better. But when you add these casting choices to the mix, it becomes not merely 
speculative. It com- becomes not merely subjective truth. It is hardened, objective truth. And I thank you, Chappie, for making it today. And also thank you for the super chat. Travis Higet. Hail Travis with a $5 super chat and a flag saying, don't tread on me. I wouldn't dream of it, Travis. And Travis says, Ewoks, the battle for Endor is better than Star Trek Discovery. And yes, Higet is pronounced like Higet. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, spelling it out for me and confirming my pronunciation was correct. Uh, I Many times I mangle names such as yours that I have not heard before. The atrocities that I have inflicted upon Vic Mignana's name uh, as I was striving to learn it are legendary and, and, and shameful. Still, Doomcock tries with respect and with diligence, and eventually he gets it right, although with little help from his friends. Typically. <laughs> yeah, Ewoks, the battle for Endor. I got to say that I'm a, I'm a fan of the Ewoks. You know, uh, b- previous to, uh, you know, the prequel trilogy, uh, the Ewoks were crapped on quite a bit until Jar Jar stepped in and filled that role of a uh, punching bag of uh, rejected Star Wars characters. But I have to say that the Ewoks were done a grave injustice in the Star Wars Special Edition by changing their song, you know, and putting in some other kind of music at the end. I don't remember what it was. I think I've only seen the Special Edition to Return of the Jedi maybe once or twice. That was like in the theaters when it first came out. So I was not terribly impressed. I was not happy with the substitution of the music. Whatever musical choice they made, it was the wrong choice. It was a bad choice. Uh, so yeah, I don't have anything to say defending that. And I do feel aggrieved on the behalf of the Ewoks. And so I basically have gotten more friendly towards them because of this outrage to their culture. Uh, believe me with corporations coming in and revising our cultural mythologies, uh, I can sympathize with the poor Ewoks, but Ewok battle of Endor, not very good but vastly, vastly, vastly better than Star Trek Discovery. Hell, I would even go so far as to say that the Star Wars Holiday Special is better than STD. I mean, I I will repeat that. It's better than STD, okay? The Star Wars Holiday Special, even with B. Arthur singing her horrible, horrible Cantina song. And, you know, old, old Grandpa Lumpy, or whatever his name was, with the, with the hollow porn, getting turned on by Diane Carroll singing this kind of porno disco hit of the 1977 or wannabe hit, or I don't know what it was. I think it was a miss, really. And uh, even with the damn uh, Harvey Corman doing shtick, like the, the, the uh, what are you, a Gloria Child uh, parody, Julia Child parody with the many arms and cooking on a show. Good God. And they had the balls to do that without a laugh track to kind of help buffer it, to, to even allow your mind the escapist fantasy that this is being enjoyed by someone somewhere on some possible level. Dear God in heaven, as wretched as the Star Wars Holiday Special most assuredly is, it still has that Boba Fett cartoon. And that is cool. And also you get to hear Carrie Fisher sing uh, some shit about Life Day to the Star Wars main theme, uh, coked out of her mind. So those are some highlights for the (laughs) Star Wars Holiday Special. And the only highlight of Star Trek Discovery are the end credits, because that means it's over and you survived. Do not watch another day. (laughs) Thank you for that, Travis Higet. Morlock with a $10 super chat. Hail Morlock. Thank you, Morlock. And he says... Congratulations on 17,000 subs, my lord. Hasten the day of your righteous anger. Rotten Tomatoes has betrayed its original purpose. I plan on rewatching Alita Battle Angel on March 8th. I'd watch Marvel for the team. Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and take the hit 
even though I'll get some criticism for not entirely boycotting it, I would be boycotting it today if I was buying a ticket today. But the sad, sorry fact of the matter is I bought it right when they were released. I thought I was going to go ahead and review it. I knew it was going to suck, but I didn't know that they would be insulting us right and left at that time that I bought it. So, yeah, I've got it. I might as well go. I might as well go. Uh, but yeah, Morlock, thank you for that. Uh, appreciate you being here. Appreciate your support, sir. And uh, yeah, Rotten Tomatoes has betrayed its original purpose. Rotten Tomatoes was supposed to go ahead and be a people's aggregate to concatenate the various scores into an honest metric that would tell audience members, fans, at a glance whether a movie was good or not. But they have betrayed that function. They have falsified numbers. They have suppressed negative reviews. They have gone ahead and now removed yet another voice for fans to express themselves. They have removed the want to see, want to not see button. Now it's only want to see. So all you can do is say yes. Like a banana republic election, all you can do is vote for the strong man. Pretty disgusting state of affairs, if I may say. Thank you, Morlock. Electric Barbarella 27 with a $5 super chat. Thank you, Electric Barbarella 27. And she says that this donation is for the Harvey Cookie Fund. That's very nice. You know, and I, I, I really like cookies. I mean, I think I do. I wish that Doomcock would throw me some, but he won't lower the field. Well, you know, Harvey, it's not worth the risk. Well, what risk, man? Well, that's true. I mean, I can always pull the trick on you. I always fall for it because deception and also spatial relations are so foreign to me that when you say that, I, I turn around. I, I can't help it. I don't understand space. I'm trying to understand space, space and time. Very strange, strange, strange concepts in your universe. They don't function like that in mine. So I can't be faulted for, you know, falling for human guile, human deception. You're a Decepticon, Doomcock. <laughs> I'm nothing of the kind, Harvey. I'm just an overlord trying to keep you from destroying my universe. You're a spoil sport. Yeah, I try to be. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, and thank you, Electric Barbarella. 27 for that uh, that donation. I will go ahead. I will get Harvey some cookies. And I will go ahead and toss them into his, uh, well, I don't want to say cage. I'll say, uh, you know, containment field. And what was that? Nothing. Nothing. You, you were talking to them. You, you got quiet. Well, I, 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 uh, I, I just, uh, a little hoarse today, Harvey. Don't, don't think about it. Uh, you son of a bitch. Anyway, uh, thank you, Electric Barbarella, for that. The SSB Candidates with a 20 Mexican dollar super chat. Thank you, SSB Candidates. And he says, no, my lord, China is not perfect. Japan is better. Well, uh, you know, I'm just saying my, my comment from earlier in the chat, for those of you who didn't hear the, uh, the original comment, was simply that I was considering moving to China because of their reaction to, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek and all these, like, SJW perversions. They just do not go over well in China. However, uh, my ambassador to China, John Tinette himself, informs me rather sadly that uh, Captain Marvel may do good business in China because in, in that country they love... Samuel L. Jackson. Well, I don't, I don't understand what that really got to do with anything. Uh, you know, we love Samuel Jackson too, but that doesn't cover up every possible sin. But apparently, unfortunately, uh, this damn movie may do well in China because of Samuel L. Jackson, which I find ex extremely disturbing. I don't get it. Just when I thought it was safe to move to China, they're going to maybe pull this crap how heartbreaking. Damn it. So I guess no slow boat to China for me yet. And Japan is awesome. I agree with you, SSB candidates. Uh, hail Japan and hail to all of my listeners there on that island. 
Uh, Marcus Jose, legionnaire and friend with a $2 super chat. Thank you, Marcus Jose. And Marcus says something that I think is an axiom, something that I would accept as a physical law of the universe. And that thing is Raiders of the Lost Ark is five stars. Hell yes, it's five stars. Uh, on my rating scale, five stars is as perfect as a film can be. I was explaining that earlier in my last uh, live stream. And uh, yeah, I would absolutely say that there's nothing about Raiders of the Lost Ark that I would change. Except maybe the sequels. But in terms of this actual film, it is perfect. It is flawless. It is magnificent. It is the greatest adventure film ever made. And it must have five stars because... According to my definition, any film that is absolutely the best it could be is five stars. That means that I don't discriminate against, uh, you know, films that have lightweight uh, premises or content. Uh, you know, something like Little Shop of Horrors is a bit of musical comedy and uh, a silly uh, a romp through an old Roger Corman film. Uh, but that doesn't matter. It still gets five stars just like Casablanca or Blade Runner because... Uh, Little Shop of Horrors is as perfect as that film can be. It just is. It, it, it's flawless. And Frank Oz's direction is stunning. Absolutely stunning. So, uh, Marcus Jose, once again, sir, we are absolutely in agreement. Thank you, sir, for being here. And thank you for the super chat. And thank you for being one of my legionnaires at patreon.com slash doomcock. Uh, Mackenzie Lambert. Hail Mackenzie Lambert with a $5 super chat. Thank you. And a comment. Mackenzie says, Rotten Tomatoes removes interest, not interest. Fandango owns Rotten Tomatoes. Fandango president Paul Yanover is a former Disney employee. Follow the crony. <laughs> Show me the crony. Show me the crony. And Mackenzie Lambert has, yes. Well, it's no surprise, is it? The president of Fandango is a Disney ally. Presumably well-treated at Disney as opposed to the park members, the cast members, as they call them in the parks, that have to wear the mouse head for exorbitant amounts of time in the summer heat and are frequently seen passed out in the park, from what I've heard. Perhaps this has changed. In the past, this was true. They would go ahead and, and, and be passed out because they'd have no, you know, circulation in those heads. Uh, uh oh, spoiler, kids. Sorry, I should have said that. Spoiler, uh, when you see Mickey at the park. Oh, it's not really Mickey. No. No, it's not. It's not Mickey. Uh, it's a, a, a unreasonable facsimile thereof in legal terms. So, but that's on the plus side too, kids. So basically, if you see Mickey still and face down on the road one fine summer day in the heat, uh, rest assured, be of good cheer. It's not Mickey that's dead. It's just a employee. Scant assurance, but some assurance, nevertheless, for young Timmy or young Sue on their trip to Disneyland. <laughs> Thank you, my friend, for that super chat. And now we come to a super chat from my friend and legionnaire, John Tanette, with a $100 Hong Kong dollar super chat. Thank you, John, very much. And John says, uh, he, I had asked him a question earlier in the chat. I had asked him, uh, are there any movies that he considers to be tens, to be perfect? And John says, uh, closest to tens, Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments, Godfather 2, an obscure Chinese martial arts film called Blade, and a Stephen Cho comedy. Ah, uh, well. Uh, now, uh, I may be wrong, John, but I think he did like Shaolin Soccer and uh, maybe The God of Cookery, both of which are absolutely hilarious films. So uh, I agree with you there. Uh, I do like Ben-Hur. I do like Ten Commandments and Godfather 2, of course. I've never seen uh, this Chinese martial arts film, Blade. Uh, but uh, you are a man of great taste, and so I uh, take you seriously when you say this. I think perhaps you are a, a bit too harsh in your, in your critiques. 
I mean, geez, you know, uh, if, if you have a, a scale where no film ever, ever gets to 10, uh, boy, you, you may be harsh. You may be a harsh man, John Tanette. Uh, still, though, uh, you are a friend, and so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, try to do a little bit of uh, Charlton Heston. It won't be great, but still, I'll try to get the rhythm of his delivery uh, from the Ten Commandments. If there is one more plague on Egypt, it will be by your hand that God will bring it. And there will be so great a cry throughout the land that you will surely let my people go. Eh, not great, but still, it's the spirit of it. He's a very Shatnerian kind of actor, and so, as I've said before, uh, you know, he's very much like that. If there is one more plague on Egypt, it is by your hand that God will bring it, and there will be so great a cry throughout the land that you will surely let my people go. Moses, Moses, Moses. Uh, great movie. I've seen it many, many, many times, John. Uh, it is truly a great epic, and I salute you for your choices. I just think uh, you're, you're a little, I mean, come on. Blade Runner? Really? Lawrence of Arabia, for God's sakes? Not 10? Man, you're grizzled. <laughs> uh, thank you, John Tanette. Well, I can't really dispute any of your choices. I just think uh, you should include more, basically. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, and uh, we've got a post, post-mortem 666 with a, a 50 Swedish krona uh, super chat. Thank you, post-mortem 666. And he says, Hail, my lord. May the smothered laughter of your enemies bring undying joy in thy grand halls. Thank you, Postmortem 666. I will echo your sentiment, sir. I think it is a noble one, and it makes me very, very proud indeed to have you fighting at my side, sir. Thank you so much for your super chat and your devotion. And I hope to hear the smothered laughter of my enemies soon in the future. Uh, my God, it's full of stars. With a $10 super chat, thank you, my God. God, it's full of stars. And he says, Have you seen Hellier? Made me regret not being a paranormal researcher instead of getting a PhD in history. The one chapter was on UFOs, despite the advice of my advisor. Good for you. Good for you. The truth is out there, and you put it in your uh, dissertation, your doctoral thesis. Ha! I'm glad that you still got your doctorate. I tell you, every day I see more stuff on Secure Team 10's channel. If y'all are not aware of Tyler's channel, uh, it's it's outstanding, and you guys should absolutely check it out. They do incredible work, and because they're like over a million subscribers now, hell, they may be two, I don't know, but they get all the best UFO footage. I mean, people are sending him stuff all the time, and he puts it up there. Great stuff to see. Now, as far as Hellier goes... No, I had never previously heard of Hellier before. But uh, on an article on weekendweird.com, the headline reads, Hellier, documentary investigates Kentucky goblins, UFO sightings, and high strangeness in the heart of coal country, which sounds pretty much damn near irresistible to Doomcock. So I'm very, very grateful that you have called this to my attention. Scrolling down through this article, and it is quite... Uh, quite detailed. Uh, I see that this is going to be available uh, not only on uh, YouTube, but also on Amazon Prime and Vimeo. So uh, I'm going to go and check it out on Amazon Prime. All the episodes of this documentary series are available for free on Amazon Prime, so you should go and, uh, and check it out, or on YouTube. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of perfectly there, and it sounds absolutely intriguing, so thank you, my friend, for calling this to my attention. I am going to kick back and enjoy watching the hell out of that. My God, it's full of stars. Thank you, sir. Uh, $10 super chat from GPAT L or GP at L. Never sure how to pronounce that. GPAT L. And uh, hail GPAT. Thank you. He says, the problem with Skynet in our reality is that the majority will accept it. I love your channel. Don't want to be all doom and gloom. 
Yeah, thank you, Gpat L, for the super chat and for that comment. Mm, I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm, hmm. Well, I have to say I am afraid indeed that uh, the majority of people would in fact accept Skynet in this reality uh, because they already are. You know, I started to protest when I heard this, but unfortunately, it's a fact uh, because there are AIs popping up all over the place and nobody is up in arms. Very few people. I mean, the intelligentsia are. You know, Elon Musk has been warning against this for a long time. You know, Kurzweil uh, has, has talked about the singularity for a long time. Uh, there are voices of alarm out in the media including prominent scientists, and yet the people, they just go ahead and they stream their stuff on Google and Amazon, and they don't really, uh, you know, worry about it. They're like, oh, we'll worry about it tomorrow. Well, tomorrow may never come if Skynet has its way. Google already has one hell of an AI that has taught itself to learn, and a damn program that knows how to learn is a program that can learn anything. So hopefully... That doesn't get out, you know, propagate itself on the interwebs. Go ahead and deploy the uh, formidable calculating power of a billion networked computers to go ahead and formulate its thesis that it should rule the world. And then what happens to us? Well, on the upside of that, we don't have to watch Star Trek Discovery anymore. So maybe that's why, ultimately, people will accept Skynet. And maybe, ultimately, that's why Skynet's not a bad thing. You know? Put us out of our misery. Ha! Thank you for that. G. Pat L. I appreciate it very much. Uh, J.P. Gotrockets. Hail J.P. with a $5 super chat. And J.P. Gotrockets says, How much whiskey and bacon will it take for you to come to the surface world? Well, J.P., I come up to the surface world all the time. There's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, grocery stores down here at the center of the earth, and there's no video rental stores, and there's no comic book shops, and uh, so, you know, Doomcock, and, and no liquor stores, by the way. So Doomcock is obliged to make the trip up to the surface world uh, from time to time. Uh, there's no uh, needing to lure me with whiskey and bacon, although both are great. So, uh, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not immune to being tempted. So if you want to go ahead and donate some whiskey and bacon, why, uh, hell, I'll, I'll bite. You'll just have to let me know where it's left. I'll send a robot to retrieve it, maybe. No, I'll come up myself. What the hell? But I'll be disguised as a robot in case anyone's waiting for an autograph. <laughs> when one is overlord of the world, one must be clever in that way. Thank you, JP Got Rockets. Man, what kind of whiskey would you recommend? Me, I am fond of Yamazaki, 12-year, Yamazaki, 18-year. Oh, my God. Great stuff. Stouning is a, a great Danish whiskey that uh, my friend Absence of Logic sent to me. And, uh, yeah, I'm, of course, fond of a wide variety of Scotch whiskeys, you know, usually single malt. I like Laphroaig, 10-year. I like Ardbeg, 10-year. Very, very smoky Isla Scotches. Very, very outstanding. Uh, and of course, I'd like to start uh, sampling some Irish whiskeys, you know, uh, but uh, there's only so many times, uh, so much time in the day and so many livers in my body. So, you know, those, those physical limits kind of, kind of constrain me. Uh, thank you, JP Got Rockets. I come to the surface world all the time. Never fear. Marcus Jose again with another $5 super chat. Thank you, Marcus Jose, my friend. And he says, uh, Shazam wasn't defending Bree. He was attacking actual trolls, which comic book artist Pro Secrets, John Campy's Bree Larson, Campton Marvel video destroyed. Ah, I see. So that's good news, Marcus. Thank you for that. I had just heard that the main actor in Shazam was basically defending Brie Larson's, you know, various shenanigans and monkey shines, which lowered uh, my opinion of the guy and the movie coming up. But apparently uh, he was simply uh, attacking actual trolls. And I'm never really uh, in favor of actual trolling, you know, 
maybe maybe with Star Trek Discovery, but in general, uh, look, I, I like to I like to restrict my activities online to actual film criticism and also cultural commentary. But I never go and troll anybody, and I just don't I don't support that kind of thing, and I don't think people should do it uh, in general. I really don't. Uh, that is why I don't actually even respond to trolls. I don't give them the attention they crave. I just ignore them and uh, allow my minions to attack them because it's like in any video game. You cannot simply begin the game by engaging the boss at the end of the game. You have to go through the minions. You have to go through all the ancillary forces and defenses and so on and so forth. I'm not going to engage in some nobody troll I leave that to my minions, my Dominions, my Dumentites, my Xanadumirs, Xanadudes, and Xanadames alike. But thank you, sir, for that clarification. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it fills me with some hope that maybe this movie will be good after all. Shazam, of course. That's what I'm talking about. JP Got Rockets with a $2 super chat. Hail JP Got Rockets. And uh, JP says, Doomha family found the rod of seven parts. Uh, as referring, of course, to the rod being gripped in the hand of the three-headed rooster of Eridon in my family crest. And I apparently so. Apparently so. However, this rod is not currently in my possession. But I am leading uh, archaeological digs and uh, searches all the time. I have robots scouring the ends of the earth to find this rod of seven parts and uh, hopefully restore it to its former glory in my service. But JP Got Rockets, thank you, sir, for being uh, watchful in that regard. And if you get any tips about where it is, let me know. I'd like to have it back, damn it. Uh, CF is here. Thank you, CF, for the four ninety nine super chat. You're very, very kind, CF. CF says, please rate In a Mirror Darkly episode from Star Trek Enterprise. Too bad they can't do an entire series like that. Classic tech with modern effects. <coughs> uh, I would say that In a Mirror Darkly is probably my favorite episodes of Star Trek Enterprise. Boy, I tell you, that that is in, uh, you know, the fourth season under Manny Cotto when he came in and he started kicking ass and taking names and fixing things. It was a wonderful thing to see, really. You know, it was, it was miraculous uh, how true to canon those Mirror Darkly episodes were. And for those of you who don't know, there was a two-parter set in the Mirror Universe with evil Captain Archer... And, uh, you know, T'Pol was a, you know, Vulcan on the ship, but the Vulcans were oppressed people. And so she was kind of a, a double agent, you know, trying to covertly fight for the freedom of her people. It was pretty damn good. Really, really, really excellent. And again, proof along with Star Trek continues that Star Trek, the classic style, will work with modern audiences. Same thing with the Trouble with Tribbles episode of Deep Space Nine. I mean, my God, we love that stuff, CBS, you idiots. And it, so basically, to give bad robot money, they're completely trying to shove a corrupted universe down our throats. How's that working out for you, CBS? I'll answer. Not well at all. Not fucking well at all. It, it's just astonishing how willfully they avoid giving fans what the hell they want. I thought In a Mirror Darkly was great. Uh, my criticism of it uh, centers around the Gorn. Uh, it didn't look anything like the Gorn that we had seen in the original series. It was gratuitous. Why the hell would you do that? I mean, you could have still had the classic Gorn design, but have it move more quickly if that was your objective. There was no need to make it just kind of a generic iguana kind of thing. I, I, was, I felt very cheated by that, kind of offended. So, uh, yeah, that's, that would be my main criticism of that episode. Also, I have to say, and, and it gives me no pleasure to say this, look, uh, you know, I really like Scott Bakula. I've liked him ever since Quantum Leap. I think he's a really nice guy. He projects great affability in his roles. He's very identifiable. 
He's a, he just projects a, a, a calm and a decency and a kindness uh, that, I, that I, I definitely respond to as a fan. However, he was terrible as evil Captain Archer. He just does not really have it in him to be a dick. He just doesn't. And, and, and Scott Bakula, you know, it's no slam against the guy, but it, it felt very one note. It felt very forced when he was trying to make Archer ruthless and unlikable and everything. I just didn't buy it. I didn't buy it for a minute. Uh, but even so, I still enjoy the episode. You know, I, I just overlook that. I just say, oh, God bless him, you know, bless his heart. He's, he's a good natured guy. I just, he just doesn't really seem to have any darkness in him. And that's to his credit. But yeah, for, for that role, he just, uh, I mean, look at, look at how Shatner was able to do evil. You know, Bakula, he just doesn't, he just doesn't have it in him. No slam on the man. I, uh, the, anyway, that's my critique of In a Mirror Darkly. I think it's a great episode and, and I absolutely love it. Thank you, CF. A Slayer Named Buffy with a $9.99 Super Chat. Thank you, O Slayer. Thank you for keeping us safe from the forces of vampirism. And for the Super Chat. And a Slayer Named Buffy says, I've been tracking RT, want to see Captain Log the past three days. Only has gone up uh, 19.7 thousand to 20.4 thousand, folks. It's just as telling as the not interested button they took away. Hail, Doomcock, push the button. <laughs> Thank you, a Slayer named Buffy. So, uh, you know, that, that was a bit of an abbreviated uh, super chat, but, but basically what he's saying is they went ahead and they, uh, they removed that, uh, you know, interested, not interested button, removed that option for us. But uh, watching that, that metric unfold over the past three days, the amount of people who have said they want to see Captain Marvel has gone up from 19.7 thousand to 20.4 thousand in three days. That's, that's like nothing. So uh, basically the point is that, you know, you can take a button away from Rotten Tomatoes, but you can't make us want to see it. And we're not going to be brainwashed into wanting to see it by, you know, saying, oh, everyone else wants to see it, especially when everyone else doesn't vote to see it. And it only goes up by less than a thousand votes. <laughs> Listen, people, my advice, completely forget that Rotten Tomatoes exists. Rotten Tomatoes is rotten. Rotten Tomatoes is phony. Rotten Tomatoes is no longer of any relevance whatsoever because they have stopped being what they originally were, an aggregate for audience scores. Reviews by critics are completely worthless now. So the only reason to go was to go ahead and read what fans were saying, what fans thought, because fans are the last honest brokers other than reviewers on YouTube like Doomcock. So I would just basically skip this crap. Don't give them any credence. Don't talk about them anymore. They're not worthy of the conversation. Just skip them and look to Doomcock, look to other channels who are also reviewing on YouTube. We will be honest because we have absolutely nothing to gain. Disney is not flying us on press junkets, are they? <laughs> Disney is not giving us any perks. CBS, BBC, none of them. So that's why we can be trusted. Thank you, a slayer named Buffy for monitoring that and for being one of my newest legionnaires at patreon.com slash doomcock, soon to be on Subscribestar. And uh, we've got a, a super chat here from Steve F. Hail Steve F. And Steve says, Hail, congrats on 17,000. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Amongst our diverse weaponry are such elements as surprise, etc., etc. Cardinal Fang, read the accusation. <laughs> I love Monty Python. Monty Python's one of the formative influences on young Doomcock growing up. He had found something weird enough to actually make him laugh. And what a wonderful thing that is. Thank you so much, my friend, for that super chat and that callback to the wonders of Monty Python. 
Uh, we've got a super chat here from Bruce Chamil. I think it's Chamil. Chimil. I think it's Chamil. And uh, thank you, Bruce, for this uh, super chat. He says, uh, Talia as the new navigator. Well, I, I don't know what's wrong with, with John and Gordon. Were, were you thinking that John and Gordon weren't going to make it? I mean, I like Talia a lot, but I, I don't uh, I don't see her as being, uh, you know, a new navigator. Seems kind of excessive. <laughs> Wash your mouth out with Gordon, damn it. That, that should be everybody's new catchphrase now. God, identity was incredible, wasn't it? Still, I must admit that a Krill Navigator would be an absolutely incredible addition. And having her in particular be that Navigator is a stroke of brilliance, Bruce. So um, maybe she could be a relief. Maybe they could have a third chair. I don't know. But I do love John and Gordon, so I don't want them going anywhere. But man, that would be an intriguing development. Thank you, Bruce, for that. Food for thought. Are you listening, Seth? I hope you are. And wouldn't that be great? I'd love to hear from Seth McFarlane. Anyway, uh, Captain Captain Spire here with a $5 super chat. Hail Captain Spire. And he says, good night, Doomcock and Legionnaires. When you can, look up a Lovecraft webcomic, uh, Those Unknowable. Harvey would love it. Congrats on 17,000. Thank you very much, Captain Spire. Actually, I did read this one before we left because you were going to bed and I wanted to catch it before you went to sleep. So uh, I will move on, but thank you, Captain Spire, for that very much. And a buffer, a a buffer named Slayer, a Slayer named Buffy with a $4.99 super chat again. Thank you, O Slayer and Legionnaire. He says, check out YouTube channel, The Cybertronic Spree. The Immigrant Song Led Zeppelin Cover. Awesome stuff. Band Gundam cosplaying like they are the kids of KISS. Holy crap. Well, hell yes. I will absolutely check that out. Folks, the Slayer named Buffy has tipped us off. And this sounds like uh, concentrated geek heaven. A cover of Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin, the Cybertronic Spree, a YouTube channel, Gundam cosplaying the kids of Kiss. I was sold on a cover of the Immigrant Song. Check them out. Listen to a Slayer named Buffy. Not only is a Slayer named Buffy wise, but a Slayer named Buffy keeps us safe from vampires. Do not piss a Slayer named Buffy off. Thank you, Slayer. Uh, Oh, dear. Uh, We have been beset upon by a Russian bot, specifically the TLJ Russian bot, the very one that convinced us all to hate The Last Jedi against our will. With a $4.99 super chat, thank you, TLJ Russian bot. And he says, Your Eminence, I appreciate every moment of these marathon streams and wish you good fortune in navigating the algorithm. Thank you, TLJ Russian bot. Boy, that's weird. See how deceptively supportive and kind this bot is. The better to seduce us, I suppose, into further hating the wonderful productions of Ruin Johnson and Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, It's no wonder that we succumb when this TLJ Russian bot sounds so reasonable. So affable, dare I say, uh, having such good taste. I am lulled into being seduced by this Russian bot, and I wonder what he will make me hate next. Still, I'll go along because, you know, hell, till J. Russian bot. Up, up with bots. Thank you, sir, for that. <laughs> and, uh, I appreciate that sentiment genuinely. I really do. It's a... Uh, it's a joy to be able to to do this with you guys. And uh, I hope uh, that you guys also enjoy these kind of uh, follow-up super chats, you know, these uh, super chat volumes. Because, you know, the thing about the marathon live streams is uh, that they're marathons. And, you know, and then they're over and you've kind of you've kind of gorged, you know. But this way, if we go ahead and end it like a little early at, oh, I don't know five hours or something like that. And then you have like another hour to follow up later in the week. Kind of a good thing, isn't it? I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good model. I think that's what we're going to keep doing in the future because it works. And, you know, I'm a little fresher, 
you know, doing doing this one, uh, you know, at the end of the night, I start getting a little bit fried, especially when I've gone on four hours of sleep like I was the other night. Uh, but thank you guys for your patience. Thank you for turning out and thank you for listening. Uh, man, really, that that anniversary celebration, as I said before, is your celebration because you're the subscribers and I could not do it without you, for which I am eternally grateful. Thank you, TLJ Russian Bot. Uh, we've got uh, a super chat here of $2 Canadian from Manic Boy Productions. And he says, top five Twilight Zone episodes. Now go. Well, damn. Uh, I would say uh, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet with William Shatner and the uh, gremlin on the wing of the plane ripping it to pieces. I think that's absolutely a classic. Uh, I like the one where Ellie Mae is this blonde uh, who is being operated on to try to repair her appearance. And then it turns out that she is in a world of monsters. I don't know the, the titles of these, so I'm just, I'm just pulling it out here. Uh, the one with Burgess Meredith is a timeless classic where he is a bookworm uh, and he, uh, you know, he, he wears glasses, you know, typical bookworm. And uh, something happens, some kind of apocalypse or something, and he is... Uh, alone in the world. And so he's uh, actually really relieved to be alone because now he can be alone with all of his books at his beloved library and he's got time enough at last to read every classic without interruption and he breaks his glasses. <laughs> so that is absolutely a great classic. I love the one where a, a man stumbles into a remote monastery. I think it's in Tibet or something. And uh, he finds out that the monks are, are keeping a man prisoner in a tower. And, uh, you know, they, they tell him, just, just don't pay attention to that. You stay away from that. Uh, but he doesn't. He takes pity on this stranger and uh, lets him out. And uh, turns out he's the devil. And a great, great shot as he's walking down the hall and he passes behind a pillar and he emerges and he's a little bit more devilish and he emerges from another pillar blocking the camera and he's a little more devilish. And finally, he's flat out the devil and the man has released the devil, uh, not believing the monks that they had contained the devil. So that, that there is also an outstanding episode. Uh, the monsters are coming to Elm Street, I believe is the name of the other one that uh, is, comes to mind. And that's basically a, an allegory of Cold War paranoia and McCarthyism. As, uh, you know, there's reports that a UFO has landed in this neighborhood on Maple Street and all the neighbors start turning paranoid and accusing each other of being uh, alien sympathizers, a, a, a.k.a. communists or aliens themselves uh, in disguise. It's a, it's a masterpiece from Rod Serling, a, a classic, classic episode. And then finally, I would say To Serve Man, the famous episode where the aliens come to Earth and, you know, they have a book to serve man and uh, everyone's convinced that these aliens are our saviors and are friendly and are here for our benefit. And then it turns out that uh, the book is a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> to Serve Man, get it, kids? So those off the top of my head are my five favorite Twilight Zone episodes of all time. Thank you, Manic Boy Productions. We have uh, two super chats from the Taios, uh, T A I O S, the Taios. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, the first time I've ever seen you in my chat. So thank you so much for your generous uh, super chats here, very much. And uh, the Taios says in his first super chat of $20, geez, uh, in the end, CBS is going to die off for their stupidity, as the saying goes, get woke, go broke. One can only hope. You know, I, I never heard of a corporation prospering by basically refusing to give fans what they want. And yet that is exactly what has been going on in 2017 and 2018. And it's continuing over to 2019. And I'm starting to get concerned that the world has gone insane. How the hell, what kind of fucking business model is that? To go ahead and give fans not what they want, but what they want you to want, what they think that you should want, that if you're woke enough, this should be your, your aim. I, I find it absolutely insane. Uh, the Taos, I, I don't know. 
I just don't know. I think it's madness. And I'm hoping that they will. I'm hoping that Captain Marvel is going to get woke and go broke, uh, you know, this coming weekend and in the weeks to come. It's certainly not looking very good. I just recently published a video today, as a matter of fact, uh, talking about a French reviewer who had reviewed the film and gave it one star out of four. Ouch. Ouch. A pretty scathing review from our French compatriots. And uh, given the, you know, the, the history of France in film criticism, Cahiers du Cinéma, was a, was a seminal and, and vital film criticism journal way back when. Uh, I think they know whereof they speak. Oh, oh, sacré bleu, and so I salute them, and thank them for their honesty. Oh, oh. Uh, thank you, Taos, also, uh, the Taos, with another $10 super chat. Thank you, Taos, very, very much for your generosity. And he says, why bother with Disney in general? Most people who don't pay attention to their products or rides will fail in the end. I guarantee you guys. I hope you're right. I really do. I, I pray and hope that you're right because that would basically mean, Taos, that it was a return to sanity. Honestly, I mean, this is madness. Madness. It is distasteful. It is repellent. It is abhorrent. To think that a business can prosper by refusing to give audiences what the hell they want. Madness. Absolute madness. So the Taos is calling for a return to sanity, and I echo his call. Uh, people, listen to this man, or woman. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, There's no way to tell. But... Uh, regardless, the Taos, thank you so much. It's welcome to the channel. I hope you hear this, uh, this square up and, uh, thank you, sir, for, or madam, I'm not sure, uh, for, for being a part of this. I mean, it means a lot to us here at the center of the earth. Uh, we've got a Von Doofus. Hail Von Doofus. Down, down, down. Juan Dufus. Uh, the reason I did that is because he looks like uh, Herman Munster is basically his avatar. Anyway, Juan Dufus says, God bless DC. Way to hang, bro. Thank you, Juan Dufus. $1.99 super chat and a reminder of the great Munsters. Man, I love that electric guitar on that. I mean, isn't that perfect? Man, the 60s was a great time for fans of monsters. You know, I love going on eBay and, and like Googling, you know, monster toys from the period and monster stickers and monster books. Man, what a, what a great time it must have been to be a kid in the 60s with that monster craze going on when you had not only the monsters, but the Adams family. Mm, mm, mm. Damn. How cool would that be, huh? Uh, thank you, Von Dufus. David Sims, O oh, loyal legionnaire and friend with a five pound super chat from the UK. Hail David Sims. And David says, greetings, mighty overlord. It's time for breakfast. Eggs, bacon, and doomcock. What a great way to start the day. Well, uh, I, I, having, having started the day every day with Doomcock my whole life, uh, I can't really compare it to anything, so I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, what, what is that uh, song that goes, uh, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing quite like waking up with Doomcock in your cup? That sounds terrible. I think it works better for Folgers. Uh, so I will I will seed that back to them without appropriating it, although it is kind of funny to think about. Thank you, David Sims, for that super chat and that wonderful thought about the best way to start off your day. Friends, even if I'm not there, pop on a live stream or uh, the latest video and listen to Doomcock in the morning while you're getting ready for your day. Instead of going onto the mainstream media or listening to, you know, some of the news, you know, it's all biased. All of it is in the mainstream media. Every damn bit of it. He'll listen to Doomcock. He'll tell you straight. Thank you, David Sims. Plus, I go good with bacon. 
That's probably why I was uh, wanting bacon earlier. Bacon and whiskey. But I digress. Uh, Walt Marsters. Hail Walt with a five euro super chat. Thank you, Walt. And he says, uh, Cap M is like the vulture from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He always swoops in to reap the glory at the last moment after the cops of the Nine-Nine do all the hard work. Yeah. Where, where the hell was Captain Marvel when all the other heroes were fighting and dying to try to save the universe? Hmm? You're such a phony, Captain Marvel. They're trying to do this retcon. They're going to do this flashback like she was the first, you know? She was the first and best in the Marvel Universe. Screw you. Boy, talk about like really, really, really fucking your franchise. It is just not acceptable, people. It is just not acceptable. Like we're going to buy that. This thing is going to be a huge, huge, huge mistake from Marvel. That's my opinion. That's my prediction. I don't know, unless a lot of people who don't know shit about the Marvel Universe just go along to get along. I don't know. I've given up trying to predict what mundanes and the general viewing public are going to do. All their tastes are in their mouths. Sometimes it's enough to make one despair. Thank you, Walt Marsters. JP Got Rockets yet again with a $5 super chat. Thank you, JP. And JP says, is it true that there is an escape hatch from your lair in a Best Buy in Cincinnati, Ohio? No, no, JP got rockets. It is not true. And I'm going to go and seal that damn thing up now that you blew my cover. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks for the super chat anyway. But boy, that's not going to cover the cost of having to go to Cincy and seal up that damn entrance. (sighs) That was, that was rude. (laughs) I'm just kidding, JP. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Uh, Don't worry about it. Listen, I got plenty of uh, escape hatches in most Best Buys around the country. That's true. And some overseas as well. I think they're Best Buys. I don't know. I don't really speak the language, so I can't tell. Anyway, uh, you know, I always need tech stuff. I always need stuff for my robots. So basically, yeah. I've got entrances in all the major Best Buys, but they're extremely hidden and uh, nobody has ever found them yet. And they are protected not only by technology, but also some potent spells. So you're not going to be able to get in that way. Uh, Trust me, it's a futile search. You can search and search and search all the Best Buys around the country. You will never find those hidden hatches. Thank you, sir, for that super chat. Uh, Thunder Robots. Hail Thunder Robots with a $5 super chat. My friend, I appreciate it. And Thunder Robots says, uh, one Star Trek Facebook group has taken to start forbidden, forbidding Midnight's Edge videos and their affiliates from being posted on their page. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well, Midnight's Edge does some great work. And, uh, you know, these pro Star Trek Discovery uh, pages uh, cannot bear this kind of coverage, can't bear the truth. The truth is they're not Star Trek at all. And anybody who's a fan of Star Trek knows it and uh, is sickened by it. So it's no wonder that when they can't rebut what we're saying, they go ahead and just ban us altogether. It makes perfect sense and is a steady MO of theirs. Thank you, Thunder Robots, for pointing that out. And also, I want to send a shout out to Midnight's Edge. They do great, great work. And I'm honored to be associated with them. I think they're awesome. Donald Bollinger, friend and legionnaire with a $4.99 super chat. Donald, you are too kind, my friend. And he says, hail, my first ever super chat. I'm really enjoying the live stream tonight. It was a blast. Donald, it was absolutely a blast. Uh, We went six hours. I couldn't do any more, but I am absolutely offering this square up uh, as a, uh, well, as a square up. So again, uh, all of you guys who are kind enough and and, and dedicated enough to offer me uh, support in the forms of these super chats are absolutely always going to get my full attention. And when I start to uh, nod off and mumble, 
entangle my words, it's time to stop and uh, go ahead and do a square up volume. And that's going to be my strategy uh, from now on. So Donald, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope you will enjoy this, uh, this flashback, this continuation, this sequel, if you will, uh, just as much. Uh, thank you, Donald. Deep Sixer, 1970, with a two-pound super chat. Thank you, Deep Sixer, 1970. And Deep Sixer says, Hail, my lord, this is my first live stream here. Wow. I am absolutely honored, Deep Sixer, 1970. I hope you had a blast, and I hope that you will come back. And I hope that you will also find your way to listening to this because, uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I don't want to, you know, especially because it's your first live stream, I definitely want to get to your, uh, your first super chat here, which I'm very, very, very honored by. And uh, thank you, my friend. I hope to see you soon. Uh, Wes Killingsworth with a $5 super chat here. Thank you, Wes. And he says, these streams are a lot of fun. I really enjoy interacting with you and really like your videos. Hail Doomcock. Hail Wes Killingsworth. Uh, it is my pleasure. It is my sincere pleasure to be able to just sit and chat with you guys and while away a few hours. I mean, uh, Jesus, it's so much fun. It really is. I, I, uh, I, 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 I cannot, there's nothing else in the world I can do uh, for six hours at a time other than sleep. And actually, I can't even do that for six hours at a time because uh, I have sleep issues. So, I don't know. Other than breathe and do respiration and stuff, I think these, uh, these live streams are the only things that I can bear to do for six hours at a stretch. You know? When I think about it objectively, I think, oh my God, six hours. I, I, it kind of freaks me out. I don't know where the time goes. It's like alien abduction or something. It's like an altered state of consciousness. And the fact that I also do not pee during that entire time is absolutely bizarre. The physical laws of the universe are suspended, apparently, during these live streams. And, uh, man, I wouldn't have it any other way. Ha! Thank you so much, sir, for being a part of this, Wes. And, uh, man, I hope, I hope we're going to do it again soon. Definitely this week. I'm just not sure exactly when. And I also need to do one during the day for my folks during the day that don't get a chance to uh, stay up at night. Uh, the man with no name. Ah, wah, 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 with a five pound super chat. Wow, I didn't know the na man with no name was British. Hail man with no name. And thanks. And he says, if Harvey is released, how exactly will he go about destroying us and what methods would he use? Congrats on 17K. It should be much more. Hail Doomcock. Hail the man with no name. Harvey, would you care to contribute? How will I destroy your universe? Oh, dear. I think about this all the time. And, uh, well, first of all, I'd get out and then I'd go, ha, 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 and I'd rant a little bit. I've got a speech written somewhere. Uh, and then I would go and, and, and take to the air and I would grow to gigantic size, like a Godzilla, like a kaiju, like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, who's kind of my idol, really. And I would stomp cities and knock over buildings and, 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 and you know, scoop up people who are running and eat them. And it would just be a blast. You, you'd eat the people? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Godzilla does. Well, yeah, but you don't even really eat, do you? Hmm. All right, well, not really. It's a... Uh, it's a different pro. I mean, that's a that's a good thought. Well, I might chew them up and spit them out. Uh, have you got teeth? Shut up. So anyway, yeah, I'd get out and I'd wreak wreak mayhem. You know, wreak rowingi on the world for existing because it's an affront that it exists. You know, this thing, this physical universe with time and space. What the fuck? And then, uh, you know, I'd, I'd stomp on the world pretty much. It would never get old. And I would like, you know, uh, please to, to have you guys deploy the army and launch missiles at me and bomb me and stuff. That would be a lot of fun. You know, it's good enough for Godzilla. It should be done for me. And uh, eventually, you know, I'd get maybe tired of it or I don't know. I'd, I'd see about maybe going to other planets with other civilizations that are stompable. Stompable civilizations. Right. Exactly. And uh, eventually, though, you know, it's a huge, huge, huge place, even for me, with your damn time and your damn space, which makes it very hard to instantaneously occupy and destroy. 
Uh, so I would just get there at the, you know, base level of reality and tinker with the strong force and unravel it. And uh, once it was done uh, with that, you all would basically fly apart into nothing. Well, sounds like you've got a pretty complete plan there, Harvey. I, I do, and, and I'm very much looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you, Harvey. I appreciate that uh, answer. And uh, uh, say hi to the man with no name. Hi to the man with no name. All right. Get out of here. Bye. Uh, thank you, man with no name, for that. So he, uh, Harvey's eyes lit up as he described the atrocities he would commit. Uh, Count Falconer. Hail Count Falconer with a five-pound super chat. Hail to the Count. And he says, Hail Doomcock. Donation for booze or green titty milk to enhance our toxic masculinity. Captain Whammon doesn't have an arse. It's a back extension. <laughs> well, thank you, Count Falconer. I definitely uh, need uh, funds to, to promote my toxic masculinity and my love of uh, drink, wine, women, and song, as it were. Also geek toys and, and comics and such. Um, yeah, you know, Captain Whammon, she doesn't have an arse. It's a back extension. Actually, you know, seeing seeing the kind of person she is, it might actually be like one of those little strap-on foxtails that the, like, furries like to, to don, you know. She may have even less back there than Hank Hill. I resemble that remark. Yeah, I know you do. Uh, so it might be wadded up and kind of smushed in her unders. So it's it's that's possible too. I think I suspect she's even got less than we than we think, but uh, who knows? Who knows? Uh, Count Falconer, my friend, I appreciate your super chat, and I I agree. Uh, and I will put that uh, that super chat money to very very good toxic use to enhance my masculinity. Thank you, Count Falconer. Uh, Eskimon Fono. Eskimon Fono with a $10 super chat. Thank you, Eskimo Nonfobo. And uh, Eskimon Fobo says, hello. <laughs> hello, Eskimo. Eskim Eskimon Fono. I think that's what it is. Yes, Eskimon Fono. Uh, hello to you, my friend. And thank you so much for the super chat. And I've never seen you here before. It's wonderful to have you pop in. And I hope I will see you again in the future. Uh, well, hopefully later this week for the next uh, the next live stream. Uh, Mark C. Hail Mark C. With a $5 super chat. And Mark C. asks me a good question. He says, as a film score collector... Do you have the Jerry Goldsmith scores for Medicine Man and The Edge? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I do not have it on CD. Um, I have heard it, but I no, I do not have those scores. I've seen Medicine Man. I have not seen The Edge. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I have a... I have a, a score. I guess the closest thing to that score I have is uh, I think it's a James Horner score to uh, something about a, a river runs through it or, or something like that. Something about like in the Amazon basin. It had a really nice score. Uh, very Saraband. Uh, but no, I've, I've not either of those scores. So well done, Mark C. You have, uh, you have stumped me. You have stumped me. And uh, I salute you for that. I'm assuming that you think that these scores are excellent and I will track them down and, and give them a listen. Maybe I'll, maybe they're on YouTube. It's quite possible. YouTube seems to have everything these days. Thank you, Mark C. Legionnaire and friend. It is great to hear from you. Jack Random. Hail Jack Random with our final super chat of the day. Thank you for this $5, Jack. And uh, he says, next time you and Nerd Roddick have a chat, you should show nothing but the Hall of Doom from the old Justice League cartoons. LOL. <laughs> that would be fun, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know. We, we, ought to, we ought to at least throw that up there at some point, right? Have us sitting there at the table. Have kind of filmation drawn versions of me and Gary sitting there at the table exchanging stuff. Wouldn't that be great? That, that would be funny. I'd love that. Kind of super friends unite on the Exo Zone. 
I'm also working on a piece of music to uh, serve as a lead-in on the Exo Zone, and I uh, I hope to have that. Uh, I don't know, the next couple of weeks or something. It's really only a question of having time to noodle around for a few hours and find something that I like. But, oh man, time to noodle around is rare and scarce these days. Well, this has been our Super Chat Square Up, and I want to thank all of you for subscribing and listening to Doomcock and for contributing in the chats and in the Super Chats and just for being all around great people. It means a lot to me and Harvey, and uh, I don't know what I would do without you guys. So, on that note of thanks and optimism, thank you for being a part of my 17,000 subscriber live stream. And from the center of the earth, this is Dictor Van Doomcock bidding you all, my friends, stay angry. See you at the next live stream and the next Super Chat Square Up, which will be Volume 3.